Well, good afternoon. Um, this is Megan Vanderselt. I'm with the Michigan Hymns chapter, and um, I'll give folks about one more minute to hopefully um, log in or call in, and we will go ahead and get started with today's webinar series. And thank you for joining us. Well, thank you again for joining us for our webinar, webinar series here for um, our Michigan Hymns chapter. Um, this month or this, this session is focused on breaking down barriers to the sharing of behavioral health information. So we're so happy to have you join us. Um, also a quick thank you to our sponsors who were a key part in making, uh, allowing us to present this key information to you all. Also a side note that we are recording this session and in the uh, interest of consent, which is timely for today's conversation, we wanna make sure that you all know that as well too. In addition, as a result of us recording this, we will um, rebroadcast this or have links up to our HIMSS YouTube channel as well too. So you can download those and re-listen uh, re to the great information and webinar that we have here today. In addition, there's a lot of other past webinars that are posted on our YouTube page as well. Um, so with that, I wanted to give a quick overview. Um, I'm fairly new to the HIMSS Michigan Chapter Board and, and um, was thrilled to be part of this organization and in addition to be part of this webinar series. Um, I currently am with the Michigan State University Institute of Health Policy, but prior to that, I was with the, the uh, within state government at the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services and had the pleasure of working within some um, some areas within this space within consent and privacy. And in fact, um, worked with Haley, our presenter, on some of the efforts that will be presented here today. So it feels like this has truly gone full circle. Um, I will note this work has, has been underway for over, oh, I got, gosh, do I say over 10 years or so. Um, and I think there's even more work to do, but uh, it, it's such a timely and important issue, I think, as was many of us are thinking about how our information is shared and how we have access to that. So with that, I'd love to present to you our presenter, Haley McCrary. Um, she is a project manager for behavioral health at Al the Alterum Institute. Her expertise is in evaluating health education and behavioral, um, behavioral change efforts in rural, domestic, and international settings. In addition, she has specialties in quantitative research and mixed methods evaluation specific to behavioral health. Haley holds a master's degree in public health from the University of California in Davis. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Haley and um, I believe she will also be guiding us through her slides as well too. Oh, one other final uh, housekeeping note if I could too, sorry Haley. Um, we would love to hear any and all questions you might have. If you could submit those into the chat box, which is located on the bottom of the Zoom screen there. Um, my colleague Lee will be manning the chat box and we have um, a lot of, uh, hopefully enough time to go through those uh, questions and answers with Haley at the end of her presentation. So feel free though to submit those at any point in time. We love collecting those and kind of preparing for hopefully a, a good discussion. Thanks so much and here's Haley. Thank you, Megan. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today. I'm really looking forward to sharing a bit with you all about what my team um, here and I at Altarum have been working on for the last couple of years. Um, as Megan said, full circle since I started out working with this project with Megan. Um, before we dive into the project, I wanted to start with a little background to kind of get everyone on the same page as to what we're talking about here today. Most of you will be familiar with everything I say, but I just want to make sure um, that we're all kind of using the same language and, and talking about the same things. Um, so as everyone in this audience will agree, uh, sharing individual health information is a really important part of delivering quality care. Um, and for some kinds of information sharing, it's pretty straightforward. Um, 
as defined in HIPAA, healthcare providers can share many kinds of health information with one another for uh, the purposes of payment, treatment, and healthcare operations without obtaining um, patient consent, um, written patient consent. And this is done pretty frequently without issue. Um, but the regulations are stricter, as many of you know, for behavioral health information. Um, they require written patient consent for certain types of behavioral health and substance use disorder records, um, which complicates things a little, whether you're sharing electronically or not. Um, the good news is Michigan, uh, in Michigan, as Megan said, we've done a lot of groundwork to help facilitate um, getting this patient consent for behavioral health records, including um, requiring that all providers accept and some providers uh, are required to use the Michigan Behavioral Health Standard Consent Form, MDHHS 5515. And of course, we've invested a lot into electronic information, sharing infrastructure, and have set up pretty innovative systems to help make um, collecting and disseminating patient information uh, easier. However, um, confusion around the rules and regulations that, that govern information exchange and patient consent, both federal and state, um, particularly for behavioral health information, um, continue to kind of confuse people and stall information sharing. Um, some of them conflict with one another and um, those and that can stall information sharing. Unfortunately, that confusion is growing, not getting smaller, um, and it's only likely to continue to grow as federal legislation continues to amend how this information um, is allowed to be shared. As, as many of you know, there's been recent changes um, in the CARES Act and the 21st Century CARES Act that changed kind of the, the regulations around how behavioral health information is shared. Um, and that continues to kind of confuse people. So that is where this project comes in. Um, in 2018, Altarum was funded by the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. Um, to help address these issues. Um, if you're not familiar with Altarum, we're a nonprofit headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and we're focused on um, health solutions for vulnerable populations. Um, we, have, we do a lot of work with health technology um, and sort of with uh, educating clinicians on how to deliver better care. Um, so we were funded by the Health, Michigan Health Endowment Fund, as I said, in 2018. Um, we partnered with MDHHS on a two-year project centered around two main goals. So the first was to help Michigan clinicians and other stakeholders to better understand the complexity of consent and confidentiality regulations around the appropriate release and exchange of behavioral health information. Um, so help kind of reduce some of that confusion I was talking about. And the second was to really better understand what would increase the number of providers and payers regularly sharing data, both what's stopping them now and what would help moving forward. So what I'm going to do today is uh, talk to you about what we created as part of that project, um, what we found, and what we recommend moving forward. Uh, one quick forewarning is I'm going to give you kind of the 50,000 foot view of the full project, which has a lot of moving pieces. Um, know that there's a lot of information there, but you don't have to memorize it. Please use my contact information after the webinar. Uh, to follow up on any particular area that you'd like to kind of do a deep dive on and I'm happy to follow up with you. Okay, so um, the project really had four main deliverables. The first was to create a, a policy crosswalk grid um, and post it to the MDHHS website. And what we mean by policy, policy crosswalk is looking across both federal and state legislature to help people understand the rules that govern behavioral health information exchange. Um, we also were tasked with creating and delivering a training webinar and videos um, with delivering subject matter expertise to stakeholders. And we wanted to shed light on uh, what motivates people to share electronic behavioral health information, what stops them from sharing that way, and what resource needs might increase um, sharing moving forward. Um, the timeline that we did this on was, like I said, began in 2018 and um, concluded in February of 2021. So you're getting sort of results hot off the press. Um, we first developed the PHI consent tool, which is that cro policy crosswalk grid that I mentioned, um, delivered sort of question or SME subject matter expertise um, and training videos. And then we held some dialogue sessions and launched a survey to kind of help illuminate that electronic exchange that I mentioned. 
So um, I'm gonna go kind of deliverable by deliverable. So the first thing we did was to develop the policy crosswalk grid, the protected health information consent tool. Um, there are three tools uh, within this. The first is the full tool, which is a 41 page kind of comprehensive document. Most of those pages are what we call caveats, which is when clinician discretion applies. Um, it has information for clinicians around what legislation they need to consult uh, to make decisions. The grids themselves, which I'll show you in a minute that help people navigate these laws and regulations are just about 12 pages. Um, and so we kind of wrap those up into a, a quicker printable um, just grid tool. And then there's a three page quick tip guide that just helps people know the really the most important things about navigating um, sharing of behavioral health information. So this is what the uh, main grids look like, um, just to kind of give you an example. So you see that there is legislation, both federal and state across the top. And then there are reasons that people might request their records on the left-hand side. And there are um, grids like this for many different scenarios, um, both just kind of general requests and then specific requests such as for minors or in situations of domestic violence. Um, and these symbols kind of represent uh, when consent is and isn't needed. So for example, a green circle means individual consent is not needed to share information. A red stop sign means it is. If there's a red stop sign in any of the main columns that you're looking at, patient consent is necessary. So in this example, what we're looking at is a request for a covered entity to inform a spouse, family member, or friend about an individual's care. And because this person is asking for behavioral health information. We're looking at the Michigan Mental Health Code and HIPAA. And when you look down those two columns, you can see that in the intersection, there's a red stop sign under the Michigan Mental Health Code. Therefore, patient consent is needed in this situation. So um, just some metrics around what, um, what we saw with this tool. Um, we saw very high use with this tool. It was posted on the, the webpage on, in September of 2019. Um, since then, we've seen almost 1,200 downloads of the full tool, followed by the quick tips and then the PHI consent, just the grids. Um, and interestingly, what we saw is that uh, most people got to the page from the MDHHS homepage and once they looked at the tool, they then exited to the Michigan Standard Consent Form, um, which is something we were, we were glad to see because that meant that people were um, then moving towards gaining consent. This slide just showcases um, that the partnership with MDHHS was very important for us to get out the dissemination of the tool. Um, these spikes you see when we saw the most page views for that tool in that page where anytime we partnered with MDHHS and other entities to get out the word about the tool. Um, the others are times when just Altarum got the word out ourselves. Now we have a pretty impressive listserv from all of our work doing quality improvement, but it was really important to have MDHHS as a trusted resource on the other end. Okay, the second deliverable was really to create um, a training webinar and training videos to help accompany the tool, but also to kind of illuminate some uh, or reduce some confusion around the, con the consent regulations, the confidential era regulations using 5515, etc. Um, so we held a webinar in October of 2019 and we had 252 attendees at that webinar. Of those 252, 99 took a pre and a post survey. So we were able to kind of measure some things before and after to see how the webinar improved um, knowledge, confidence, and, and other things like that. Um, these are the types of folks who took the, the survey. So we had mostly behavioral health organizations followed by health plans and followed by healthcare organizations. Uh, within behavioral health organizations, we had the majority were client facing, but we did have some that were not client facing organizations. And these are some demographics just in terms of um, what the participants experience with health technology and consent were. Um, at baseline, so 55% said they used 5515, 54% um, said they participated in HIE, and 60% said they struggled with um, navigating patient consent for behavioral health and regular information. What we measured is knowledge around rules and regulations that govern sharing of PHI, confidence in navigating those rules and regulations, and confidence um, in using MDHHS 5515. 
We also measured satisfaction with the resources available in Michigan to help navigate those rules and regulations. Um, and then after the webinar, we measured those same things as well as how useful the resources we presented were, that PHI consent tool, and then intention to kind of change behaviors after the webinar. And what we saw is that knowledge, confidence, and satisfaction all increase after viewing the webinar, which is of course what we wanna see. So at the bottom here on each of these graphs, you can see um, this is no knowledge, minimal knowledge, moderate understanding, good understanding, and excellent understanding. Um, and the same kind of scale with confidence of the rules and regulations, confidence in 5515, and satisfaction with tools and resources. And what we really want to see is decreases in these first two categories and increases in the last three. Um, even, and what we saw was exactly what we wanted to see, decreases in actually the first three, which is good, and then increases in the last two. Um, we also found uh, high, um, high ratings in usefulness of the, the resources we presented. Um, and then we saw 72% intended to use the PHI consent tool after, using, after viewing the webinar, which was really promising. Less people intended to use or accept 5515, um, which kind of drew our attention to the fact that this was a focus area moving forward. Um, and then we wanted to look at how those metrics differed, depending on what kind of organization you worked for, whether you used an HIE, where you were located, what your job role was, and whether you used 5515 or not. Uh, we did not find any difference in those who used 5515 and those who participated in an HIE. So their scores were relatively similar to the rest. But we did find some differences. So we found that behavioral health organizations, uh, leadership positions, and regionally, Southwest and Grand scored higher in all of those domains I mentioned, knowledge, confidence, and satisfaction. And people who scored lower was health plans, physical health organizations, operations, um, and frontline staff. And, and this includes sort of just behavioral health clinicians, physical health clinicians, as well as support staff. Uh, and then regionally, we saw that the Superior and North regions scored lower. After the webinar, we created training videos to accompany the tool, but also to highlight areas where people had expressed that they wanted more information. So we have short, they're less than 10 minute um, videos on YouTube. Um, those are publicly available. The first is navigating the PHI consent tool. So it's sort of a, a hyper condensed version of the webinar we put on. Um, and then kind of specialized topics, one on sharing substance use disorder PHI, one on sharing minors PHI and one on sharing domestic violence PHI. Uh, and we've gotten sort of a, a decent amount of views there, mostly for, for how to use the PHI consent tool. Uh, the third thing that we did as part of this project is we answered stakeholder questions as they came in. So we had a link on the MDHHS webpage, as well as a direct email address, and people could email us directly with questions around sharing behavioral health information. Um, we had 61 questions in total over the course of the project. And what you can see on the right hand side here is a graph of kind of the types of questions that came through. Um, the majority were follow up questions on the PHI consent tool, on the webinar, on the training videos, those kinds of things. But following that were questions around 5515. So we got a lot of questions on 5515, everything from is there a Spanish version? to can I um, insert my own signature line for the clinician's signature? Um, what do I do if another organization doesn't accept the 5515 even though the patient has signed it? There were just a lot of questions that came in around that form. So again, we saw this sort of burning issue that more support was needed around MDHHS 5515. <clears throat> another thing that we did as part of this project is we sent out um, email campaigns to uh, our listserv. So uh, there was a sign up sheet on the MDHHS webpage that allowed people to sign up for our listserv. Um, we got 530 subscribers to that listserv over the course of the project. Um, and we sent out email campaigns about once a month that highlighted kind of major changes or things that we saw people struggling with. So you can see these red circles are, are recent things that came out that um, we were drawing attention to uh, Cures Act, information blocking, telehealth changes, things of that nature. And the reason that this listserv um, was really important is that 
Um, for those not familiar with marketing, these might look like no low numbers, 13% and 14% click and open rates. But in, in marketing, these are really high numbers. Usually we get somewhere between eight and 10%. Um, so this listserv was a really engaged population. Um, lots of champions who really wanted this information, were hungry for it, and um, were likely sharing it with others. <clears throat> okay. The next uh, and final deliverable was kind of helping to shed light on electronic behavioral health information exchange. Um, and we had two components of this part of the project. So the first thing that we did was we conducted a survey to clarify kind of what motivated people to share behavioral health information electronically, what stopped them from sharing that information and what resources could help. Um, we held, uh, then held dialogue sessions with participants from that survey to help further explore those barriers, motivations, resource needs, and then also to kind of understand uh, if accountability, peer-to-peer -peer accountability and action planning could help increase electronic sharing of information. So I'll talk a little bit about both of those. I'm going to first do a deep dive into the survey. Um, so we sent out this survey um, statewide and we had 148 people complete the survey. You can see these are just some demographics. You can see um, on the left, 63% were behavioral health organizations, um, followed by insurance providers or health plans, um, healthcare organizations, community organizations, and then sort of a smattering of other folks. Uh, the majority were larger organizations, 11 plus clinicians, followed by four to 10 clinicians. Uh, no clinicians, and then last were kind of small, small organizations, one to three clinicians. Um, some more demographics, just the majority of people in the survey were either director or leader roles, 38%, um, followed by kind of administrators, um, and then other, and then lastly down here is behavioral health clinicians, and the, the smallest representation were medical care clinicians. On the right, you can see the behavioral health services that were offered um, by participants. So 77% offered mental health services, 55% offered substance use disorder treatment, 32% offered behavioral health integration services in primary care, and then other services as well. And then lastly, kind of we asked what, whether the organization was already sending or receiving behavioral health information electronically, uh, and 85% said yes. And that will become relevant in a moment when I, when I break kind of the results out. Okay, so in the survey, the first question we asked was what electronic systems people were using. Uh, we asked participants to talk about how they were using electronic systems at their organization. We asked about MDHHS 5515, HIEs, HIOs, HINs, ADT notifications, electronic consent management service, ACRES, direct messaging. Uh, and what we saw, um, we kind of asked it around three categories. Um, we asked whether how they used it and kind of how familiar they were with it. So people could choose from a few categories. And what you can see here is we broke it out by whether they'd never heard of it, whether they use it sometimes or rarely, or use it regularly. And this is 5515. Um, what you see here is just 40% of survey respondents said they use 5515 regularly. 42% said never or only sometimes, and 18% had never even heard of it. Um, then we broke out the results by organization to type to see how those results differed, and we saw large differences in use. So here you can see um, only 15% of physical health organizations said they use 55-15 regularly versus 50% of behavioral health organizations. So this is really important to us to understand kind of what kind of organizations we need to target when we're trying to increase 5515 use. This is the graph that kind of shows the rest of the systems um, and, and what we saw. So again, you can see kind of this middle category of um, using sometimes or rarely is kind of has the most opportunity for improvement. For example, if we were to move this 62% um, of people who are using HIEs, HIOs, or HINs um, only sometimes over to using regularly, you would have 82% of people. So that's kind of a really important um, category to look at. There were other uh, systems that the focus could be more on promotion. So acres, you can see 61% of people in this population had reported never, never hearing of it. 
Um, and there were some differences within organizations um, for these systems as well. So you can see over here for HIUs, HILs, or HINs, sort of the flip uh, side of what we just saw a moment ago with behavioral health organizations using um, or reporting using it less than physical health organizations. The next question we asked survey participants was what motivates their electronic sharing of information? Um, we asked them to rank three things that motivated them or others at their organization to send or receive behavioral health PHI electronically. And they could choose from patient's health or well-being, compliance with federal or state rules and regulations, financial or other incentives, financial or legal penalties, patient requests, provider requests, adoption of best practices, time and efficiency, or other. And here's what we found. So we found the most motivating factors were patients' health and well-being, time and efficiency, and compliance with federal or state rules and regulations. And we found the least motivating was financial or other incentives and financial or legal penalties in last place. We then broke these results out to see how participants' motiv motivations differed depending on some factors. So depending on whether they were um, reported that they share behavioral health information electronically already or not, uh, their organization type, their organization size, their job role. And what we found was that there were small differences that are important if you're looking at specific organization types and increasing use in those organizations. We did find that overall groups agreed on what motivated them most at least. So I have some tables to kind of just highlight this. Um, so these in the columns you'll see on the left, those who reported sharing, on the right, those who reported not sharing. And you can see that these align in terms of what they found most important was patient's health and well being, just as the overall results had showed. And then a little difference in kind of second place time and efficiency for those who share versus compliance for those who don't share. Um, but then in sort of last place, what was least important was again that financial or legal penalties. And again, uh, across organization type, you see patient's health and well-being ranking high, um, a little bit of, of difference in second place, time and efficiency for behavioral health, compliance for health plans, provider requests for physical health. Um, but then again, in last place, financial and legal penalties and incentives sort of least important as a motivator. By organization size, again, we just saw a lot of um, similarities in what is motivating for people. And again, similarities in what's least motivating. And for job role, again, um, similarities, patient's health and well-being most motivating, time and efficiency, and then financial legal penalties least motivating. Uh, so the second thing we asked after motivations was what was stopping people from sending or receiving behavioral health PHI electronically. Um, they could choose from time and workload, skills and knowledge, legal concerns and limitations, staffing, cost funding, understanding of EHR technology, capabilities of EHR technology, understanding of HIE infrastructure, and other. And here's what we found. So legal concerns and limitations was the biggest barrier, followed by capabilities of EHR technology and understanding of EHR technology. Uh, and understanding of HIE infrastructure was also um, ranked high, um, showcasing that understanding is an important area of uh, kind of stopping people. Uh, and then the least kind of barrier here was staffing. Again, we broke this out by those same categories to see how this might differ. Um, and again, we saw that for the most part, the, pr the priorities in terms of what is most stopping them was aligned across different types of organizations, across those who share, don't share, et cetera. So legal concerns and limitations still at the top. A um, Little bit of difference in those who share um, capabilities of the EHR technology is, is a leading barrier for them, understanding for those who don't share, but staffing commonly at the, in last place. Uh, for organization type, again, legal concerns, limitations right at the top, capabilities across the board of EHR technology ranking as a second place barrier, and then staffing and cost funding kind of in last place. You can see that cost and funding as a barrier is lower for physical health um, than for other organizations. Um, and we think this is because they have received kind of historically more um, support for technology 
um, adoption. And so they're seeing cost funding and financial incentives as sort of less important and less of a barrier. Um, by organization size, again, you're seeing legal concerns and limitations at the top. You can see here that understanding of HIE infrastructure ranked higher for the small clinicians than for others. And kind of in general, small clinicians across the board differ a little bit in what's, uh, what motivates them, uh, what's, what's stopping them, and what they think they need. Um, and then here in, in sort of last place, staffing again across the board. And then by job role, uh, legal concerns and limitations kind of across the top, um, no matter what, and staffing at the bottom. The last thing we asked about in the survey was what resources would help them increase behavioral health um, information sharing electronically moving forward. And they could choose from technology and IT support, financial and funding support, staff time, implementation and workflow support, consistent legal support, education and training support, or other. And here's what we found. So the most reported resource needs were technology and IT support uh, and education and training, which aligns with what we saw in the last um, question about what is stopping people. And then the least important resource needs staff time, which again aligns with the fact that staffing was the least important reported barrier. When we broke these out, we saw a lot of alignment. So you can see um, kind of at the top, education, training, and tech IT support for those who share and don't share. Um, and we saw at least important staff time for those who share, implementation workflow for those who don't share. Um, for organization type, we saw, um, again, tech and IT support and education training kind of across the top of most important and staff time and financial funding in lowest place. Again, here you see that physical health organizations are ranking financial and funding support as lower than other organizations in terms of its importance of a resource need. Um, more alignment here, except for, as I mentioned a moment ago, small clinicians um, were a little bit different. So you can see they reported financial funding support as second place as most important resource needs. So um, this makes sense. Smaller clinician practices are likely to need more support in terms of getting electronic infrastructure off the ground. So it makes sense that they're reporting this as, as more important. But otherwise, you see kind of agreements across the board in terms of what's, what's important and what's not important. Um, and another difference to note here, um, that leaders feel that legal support is an important resource, whereas we really didn't see that amongst other um, types of job roles. Um, otherwise, though, job roles agreed that tech IT support and education training were most important uh, and staff time least important. Okay, so after we, we got those results, um, we had those dialogue sessions I mentioned. And these were really, as I said, um, they had two goals. The first was to discuss those survey results a little and shed more light, uh, more qualitative light on what motivates people to share, what's stopping them from sharing and their resource needs. And then we also wanted participants to develop action plans um, to see whether kind of that peer-to-peer -peer information sharing and accountability would help increase individual sharing practices within their organizations. So we had um, two sessions spaced a month apart. There were 16 participants in the first and 10 in the second. So some attrition between the two, but still a good turnout. Um, the majority were behavioral health. So they sort of represented the demographics we saw in that survey. 60% behavioral health, 15% health plans and 7% physical health organization representation. Um, and it was a pretty high baseline of um, their baseline knowledge um, and understanding around uh, Michigan protected health information rules and regulations. About 60% had good or excellent understanding. And what we found from this um, group is that they largely echoed what we saw in the survey, but gave us a little more detail. So in terms of motivators, what motivates people to share electronic behavioral health information, um, we saw patient outcomes as most motivating that aligns with that patient health and well-being being at the top of the survey. Uh, we saw time savings as a top motivator, um, rapid information sharing between systems, and we saw that incentives and penalties were not particularly motivating for folks. Um, so here's a quote here. I think there's an assumption that there's a lack of willingness. Penalties are just punishment for something we're not doing willing. We're not avoiding this willingly. We really do have legitimate problems we need to work through. And that was sort of the general consensus. Um, 
they did, participants did note what we saw in the survey, which is that incentives do help for small practices to offset the software costs. <clears throat> in terms of barriers, again, we saw a little bit more detail on what is stopping people from sharing electronically. Um, we first kind of heard more about that, those legal concerns or confusion. Uh, we heard lack of understanding around the rules and regulations, which we're familiar with, uh, differing opinions of, of whether or not the forms 5515 meets Title 42 CFR Part 2 regulations. Uh, we saw really strong culture and views of not sharing in specific systems. Um, so this quote here, just because we can doesn't mean we should. This wasn't from one of our participants, but it was uh, a participant who was noting things that they had heard from, from people on their staff. Um, so yes, we know that the, the regulations say that we can share substance use disorder information, but you know this is really sensitive information and uh, I don't really feel comfortable sharing it with others. Um, and then we saw concern over privacy investigations or legal ramifications. Um, so you can see over here, um, we did have somebody come after us. That makes you more sensitive. Maybe that's why we're so cautious. Um, and, and 42 CFR changing, um, making people more cautious. Um, more barriers, we saw challenges with standardized consent. Um, we heard redundancy, repetition, or different forms required by different organizations. Um, so over here, you can see this quote, we've tried to use a standardized form, half the time they send it back saying we can't use that one, um, or we didn't see them sign it, so we can't use that. So people getting frustrated with trying to use it and, and not having luck. Um, we heard a lot about the, the ability, um, needing the ability to parse out what is sent to whom in terms of holding back parts of the records. Um, some people you know, want certain parts of their records shared, but not other parts. Uh, and, and participants felt that that's, this was a major barrier in them using standardized consent form. They also felt some lack of confidence that the sharing would be limited to those organizations included in the form. Um, and they wanted to have more patient buy-in for completing 5515. <clears throat> Another barrier was technology limitations. Um, so this speaks to kind of what we saw uh, in the EHR and technology capabilities barrier in the survey. Um, People spoke to kind of, of course, EHRs not talking to each other, which is always a problem, but also, again, this concern of lacking, of lacking the ability to hold back parts of the record. Um, talked about inconsistent or incomplete information sharing. Uh, and then again, lack of confidence in how the technology manages that information and if it's really protecting the privacy and the, um, that the patient is requesting. So you can see this quote over here, when you're dealing with people with serious mental illness, they change their consent frequently, who they're willing to share it with, what they're willing to share. Um, they may say, I don't want that agency to know my diagnosis, but it's okay for this agency to know. And that changes. Uh, and participants felt that they didn't have much control over that and respecting the patient's wishes. And then what they asked for was, um, in terms of resource needs, um, again, echoed the survey, so more training um, around the rules and regulations that govern this information sharing. Uh, around the technology itself, and then around the standardized consent form. They wanted more resources, um, specifically resources on kind of how to train staff to engage patients um, around the benefits of sharing and give them kind of more autonomy and more buy-in, more agency in the process. Um, they really wanted to be able to see kind of the information that was sent through my hand. I think that was really a, um, trying to get at increasing that confidence in how the information is being managed. Uh, and then they kind of, uh, folks talked about more investment in the behavioral health community, um, specifically in terms of supporting technology adoption and, and infrastructure. The last thing that people really wanted was more opportunities for collaboration. So this was a group of, of champions um, and even within sessions, they were sharing information and resources that they had created themselves to increase sharing um, within their organizations. And they felt that was really positive and wanted more opportunities for that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning and collaboration. They mentioned, you know, having more opportunities for champions to come together at conferences, meaning maybe learning collaboratives, focus groups, things of that nature. Uh, and they wanted more collaborative opportunities to bridge kind of the behavioral health and physical systems so that kind of training and resources were more standardized um, and collaborative across the board. <clears throat> And then, as I mentioned, we did this action planning. So we had folks kind of designate how they wanted to change um, 
their practices within their organization to help increase behavioral health, electronic information sharing. And then um, we gave them a month to kind of put those things in, in place and come back and let us know how it went. And what we saw is that that action planning increased both sharing behavioral health PHI electronically. Um, so you can see modest increases from um, people saying that they never share, dropping to zero, um, and increases in saying they they sometimes share and then they share almost every time. And then they also increased their intent to increase sharing moving forward. So again, dropping from no intention to increase sharing moving forward um, to increases in their intent to increase sharing soon or in that they are already sharing more now after these action plan sessions. <clears throat> okay, so there's a lot of information, a lot of different pieces of that program, but we do have some kind of key takeaways and program recommendations. The key kind of takeaways from those, all of those results um, is that confusion persists when it comes to sharing PHI in the state of Michigan, particularly around sharing behavioral health information, including substance use disorder information. But knowledge, confidence, and satisfaction can be improved with training and resources, particularly for those individuals and organizations and regions that, that rate low at baseline compared to others. To go ahead and increase um, information exchange, uh, we really need more training and resources. That's what we saw in the survey, especially around behavioral health uh, and substance use disorder regulations, electronic information sharing, and around the, the use of the MDHHS 5515. And um, more training and resources are needed for specific areas than others. So physical health organizations, health plans, and the Superior North regions are just a few that we uncovered within um, our survey that are sort of in more need than others of more training and resources. Um, there are more commonalities than differences in terms of what motivates people from um, to share behavioral health information electronically, what stops them from sharing, and what they feel they need to increase sharing. So that's important when you're considering where to put your investments. <clears throat> and we saw that training, sort of information gathering, dialogue sessions, action planning, these were all really powerful tools for understanding what's stopping people from sharing this information and, and what can help moving forward. Uh, and then of course, partnerships and collaboration were really key for this program um, for both understanding the barriers that prevent sharing of uh, protected health information in Michigan, and then also for creating the solutions to address them. So some recommendations of what we would like to see moving forward. Um, so the first is we need to continue to, to prioritize the exchange of protected health information, particularly behavioral health information. Um, and there's some you know, specific things we can do to do that. Um, we would like to see uh, the state maintain a central website to manage questions from stakeholders, provide information, house these resources like the PHI consent tool. Uh, and of course, we need to continue to update the PHI consent tool as legislation continues to change. Um, to that note, we need to prepare for getting a lot of questions on those legislative changes that we're going to see in the CARES Act um, and in from the Cures Act, the information blocking legislations that are coming through. Um, and then if, on the statewide rollout of the electronic consent management system, which is in the pipeline as well. The second recommendation is really to use data to drive investments. Um, we found in just sharing these results that a lot of people were surprised of, of what they saw in terms of what was motivating people to share, what was stopping them from sharing, what they wanted. Um, and that's really important. If we're going to invest in the right resources to increase information sharing, we really need to, to kind of use the voices of the people who are struggling to help guide where we put those investments. Um, so using those top motivations, barriers and resource needs to drive change, um, prioritizing training and education on those hot topics that we're continually seeing over and over again as, a, as an issue, <clears throat> increasing resources for those folks who, who do rate lower at baseline um, and are struggling more with certain topics, um, providing technical assistance on the use of electronic systems so we can see increases in adoption there. Um, and then of course, creating integrated training and awareness efforts that incorporate both the behavioral health and physical health um, kind of domains. <clears throat> the third recommendation is to address those legislative changes um, and the conflicts and confusion around those changes, um, as well as just an existing legislation. 
Um, so there are areas of the of Michigan state legislation that are um, outdated, uh, unnecessarily stringent and out of line kind of with HIPAA. Um, and because our state, uh, the way that we protect individuals is to lean on the more stringent of the laws, um, what happens is that it un unnecessarily or maybe even unintentionally hinders information sharing um, by, by leaning on a more stringent law than is necessary. Uh, we also need to really make sure to ensure understanding of those forthcoming legislative changes. Um, the CARES Act has, um, as many of you know, has clauses in it that alter how substance use disorder information can be shared. Um, and it also, the CURES Act has information on how information blocking will be penalized moving forward. Um, and both providers, clinicians, payers, healthcare leaders all really need to be informed about this moving forward. Uh, and then finally, leveraging partnerships and champions um, to accelerate information exchange is a, is a key thing here. So continuing to build partnerships between MDHHS and other implementation focused organizations who are really on the ground, hearing from organizations around what they're struggling with, um, bringing stakeholders together. We found this was really important throughout our project. And then, you know, we heard from participants a real need to kind of uh, bring champions together and leverage champions to uh, increase uh, adoption of electronic information and help sped, spread best practices around. Um, and then, like I mentioned, it's just really important that we keep sort of interested and engaged organizations informed. These are the people that are, that are really already helping to champion information exchange, and we want to make sure that they're continually engaged and armed with the information they need to help continue to move this forward. Okay, so that is sort of in a nutshell what our project was over the two years and sort of the main key findings and recommendations that we had. Um, so I know that was a lot of information. I, I would like to pause here um, and open the floor up for questions. Thanks so much, Haley. Uh, this is Lee. We do have one in the chat. Um, do we know how typical Michigan is in terms of consent complexity? Is there any benefit in sharing lessons learned with other states or are the solutions very Michigan specific? Great question. Um, so in terms of sharing lessons learned with other states, I think there is a lot of value in doing so. Michigan is, is actually looked to as a leader in our, in our solutions um, for how we're increasing the ability of people to easily gather patient consent. So states are already looking to us um, for leadership in these areas. And I think this information um, would only help other states. Um, in terms of if we're unusual in terms of our, how strict our regulations are, I would say it's not unusual. There are many other states who also have more strict state legislation um, than federal legislation. Um, but there are other leader states who have taken um, swift action to sort of amend some of those that, that are um, blocking information exchange. Perfect, thank you. If anybody else has any other questions, uh, please put them in the chat. I think I see one that was just added, uh, Lee. Okay, yeah, the survey showed that people were concerned about the compliance uh, with rules and regulations, but not with financial penalties. Um, if it's not the fines, what about compliance um, is worrying them? Uh, should, should they be more concerned with financial penalties than they are currently? Great question. Um, yeah, so financial penalties, I think, are, is very different from people's concerns around compliance. Uh, when people think about compliance, they think about whether or not they're breaking the rules. Um, they start thinking about legal ramifications, like getting sued or losing their medical license. Um, and then they also think about patient protection, uh, which is, you know, some of the things we heard in the, in the dialogue sessions. Um, if I share without consent, 
you know, and I really need consent, I'm, I'm potentially sharing some really sensitive information um, about a patient with others that could, you know, hold important legal ramifications for them, for their insurance coverage, et cetera. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot wrapped up in compliance that isn't just penalties. Um, penalties are different. Um, we kind of heard that penalties aren't getting at the root of the problem um, and, uh, and are thus not particularly motivating. Um, and that makes sense. We know from a, a variety of different fields that penalties um, aren't particularly motivating, especially when they're small. Um, I think in the healthcare field, a lot of people, when they think of penalties, they think of kind of our pay for performance models. Um, but the difference between the pay for performance models and penalties is um, what pay for performance models actually do is kind of, they have, they kind of have non-payment for performance incentives. So you kind of get a lesser payment if you don't do what you should be doing. Um, but that's very different um, in terms of its impact on behavior than, than a financial penalty. Um, so I think what's, what's going to be really important moving forward is kind of separating um, incentives from penalties and, and how those are motivating. Um, because we know that, in, particularly for technology, incentives has been important for driving adoption moving, you know, in the past. Um, but penalties kind of are less clear in that area. Um, so we'll need to know, you know, how, how those two things differ. And then I think we also are really going to need to know how the penalties are going to be structured for information blocking, um, how serious those going, are going to be, because they haven't really been defined in terms of their impact on, on providers. Um, and that might change how people perceive penalties if there's, you know, a million dollar fine attached to them, for example. Um, right now there isn't for clinicians themselves. And we'll have to see how that kind of, how that changes moving forward. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, you, you think about all the security rules and regulations and OCR really cracking down on that. So we'll see if, it, <laughs> if the same thing happens in terms of information blocking. We do have um, a couple more here. Uh, any steps on how to uh, make the findings more actionable to support cross-sector or stakeholder information sharing? I think um, I think the way that we make them more actionable is to partner with the state on um, how we can kind of couple where investments are available with where the need really is, um, and then. You know, you can look at what we can look at what investments would be profitable, or you know, give the most return on investment across the board. But then also within organizations or within those cross sectors, kind of understanding how to invest in a way that will improve adoption and and information sharing within each kind of organization type within each sector, the behavioral health or you know physical health organizations. Um, and then, you know, I think that we can use the findings to kind of um, promote integrated efforts that are sort of cross sector. If we know that everybody mostly agrees on what, what's getting in the way, then we, that means that we can make investments more um, collaborative and, and kind of more standardized across the board and um, get folks together to kind of for more um, collaborative dialogue sessions, you know, focus groups, things of that nature. Sure, thank you. Uh, we have one more. Uh, during the project, did providers and payers have questions about permissible purposes for information sharing? Did they have specific questions around the definitions of um, payment, treatment, and operations uh, in, in the context of HIPAA and the mental health code? We did see some, you know, some general questions around kind of TPO, um, like like this person's mentioning. Um, and yeah, people had specific legal questions around, can I share in this situation? What about in this situation? Um, and since we were not authorized to give legal advice, kind of what we did is pointed those clinicians to the PHI consent tool to where they could see within, you know, um, within the laws where their rights were, and then pointed them to the clause within the um, the act or the, the legislation um, that they could read to see to see what they needed to know in order to make the decision around that um, particular question. Perfect, sounds good. Um, I don't see any other questions at this moment. 
and I will uh, let you wrap it up, Megan. Well, um, yes, thank you again so much to Haley and to Altaram for this great overview of the, of the work that was underway. I also want to say a big thank you to um, partners at Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, specifically Ashley Hill and Phil Cardenowitz that were um, key champions of this work early on. And a huge thank you to Linda Zeller of the Health Endowment Fund as well, too, that was a sponsor of this work um, a couple of years ago. And so it's so exciting to see this um, kind of come full circle and, and have better insights as to how things are working or areas for improvement. Um, and one of the questions that I think that was noted was, was in terms of next steps. So I, I invite everyone to kind of think about how we um, synthesize some of this great insight and how we kind of ideally move forward um, for broader information sharing as a, in, in a complex behavioral health space that, that of course needs to facilitate consent and privacy issues as well too. And I, the, we go on and on about all the implications of that in a post-COVID world or in a current COVID pandemic world as well too. So that's a problem. Maybe that's a whole other discussion for another webinar series going forward. But with that in mind, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to our sponsors for allowing us to um, present with you. And again, this, re this has been recorded and will be uploaded to our Michigan Hymns YouTube channel. So please feel free to go there and share or um, replay. Thank you again, and, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, everybody.